Welcome to our continuing study of the book of Colossians. This is class number 22. In class number 21, we looked at the first half of chapter 3 of Colossians. Colossians has four chapters. And if you're looking at your Bible, we spent a lot of time from verses 12 through 17. Let me remind ourselves of verse 15, 16, and 17, and then we're going to go into a whole new pericope and discussion beginning on verse 18, but a quick refresher. These are beautiful scriptures also. Let the peace of God, Christ, I should say, rule in your hearts. Difference between God and Christ. God the Father, first person of the Holy Trinity. Christ, the second person of the Holy Trinity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. That's great advice. Be thankful. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. That's for sure. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. The importance of the word of God, the importance of the word of Christ. Hearing that word in prayer, hearing that word in terms of the scriptures. As you teach, teaching is important, education, and admonish one another. So admonish, rebuke, challenge, warn, disciple, discipline, all good words. With all wisdom. Now, you're going to need wisdom when you do things. You want the wisdom of God. Refer to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 about that in the second half of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to have wisdom when we do that. And as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your heart to God, your hearts to God. As you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. Okay? So we want to be praising the Lord, worshiping the Lord, magnifying the Lord with gratitude in our hearts to God. Whatever you do, as I said in class 21, if you want just a summary, simple summary, simple explanation, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Very profound, simple, true verse, chapter 3, verse 17 in Colossians, the book of Colossians. Do this in the name of Jesus, whatever you do in what you say and what you do. Do it in the name of Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. That'll be great. So that's my goal. I'm sure that's a goal that you have for yourself. And uh, may God bless what we do through Christ, in Christ, and by Christ. Let's look at verses 18 through 22. These are rules for Christian households. Now, this is a very, very large subject. Paul covers it uh, in other places in the scriptures, in his, uh, some of his letters. Uh, very large subject. I'm going to keep this fairly brief and very simple. Uh, just uh, let's talk about this in terms of large concepts. Wives, okay, wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. As it is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Now, this is what the Lord is asking us to do in a married relationship. In a married relationship, the scripture understands that relationship between a husband, a male, and a female wife, and husbands are to love their wives. Husbands are to lead their families, and in leading their families, they are responsible to God in the leadership of their family, their wife, and if they have children. And they, the husband, is not to be harsh with their wives. They are to uh, treat them respectfully, very, very lovingly, protect them, love them, care for them, nurture them, lead them well. So the husband has a very important obligation to his wife and a significant obligation to his wife before God Almighty. Now, these are not, these scriptures here are from 
the Lord himself given to us by Paul. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Now, the ideal situation is for the husband and the wife to be in the Lord, to follow the Lord, and the husband following the Lord. The wife is not inferior to him. The wife is not superior to him. The husband is not superior to his wife. They are equal before God. They each have different responsibilities. Much like the Godhead is equal, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they have different responsibilities in the Godhead. That does not make one of them greater or more important or more significant. It means that in that relationship between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, there's this extraordinary uh, exchange of love and devotion to one another and care for one another, submission to one another in the sense that each has their obligation in the Godhead to perform that function. For example, the Son is the one that's going to be incarnate and die for the sins of the world. The Father does not do that. The Holy Spirit does not do that. The Holy Spirit's job, as Jesus talked about in uh, John 16, is to testify to Jesus Christ and to show them Jesus Christ. That's what the Spirit does. The Father sends the Son the Son's relationship with the Father in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is one where He, the Son, is being led by the Father, empowered by the Holy Spirit to do ministry. All of them are equal. All of them are God. There's a unity among themselves, and they have different functions. The husband is to love his wife. The husband is to care for her. The husband is not to be harsh with her. The husband is to be protective, loving, the husband is to be in the Lord. Now, ideally, again, the husband is to submit to the Lord and to submit to the will of God for himself and for his family. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. That submission to her husband in his leadership is based on them being in the Lord, husband and wife being in the Lord, listening to the Lord, reflecting, loving, discerning the will of God. All right. And so there's, again, there's an equality between them. There's a love between them. The love is intense, if you will. The love is intentional. The love grows as the relationship grows in Christ. So when I pray for couples, and I pray for couples particularly at church for their anniversary, we pray for the relationship in Christ. We pray for their love for one another in Christ. We pray for their solidarity in Christ and their caring for one another in Christ. From God's perspective and God's will, the husband is to lead his wife and the wife is to submit to her husband. Obviously, a good leader listens a, a good leader uh, also submits and cares for his wife and listens to his wife in the sense of credibility and sense of respect. There's no lording it over and being dominating all that kind of crazy stuff. That's, that's not of the Lord at all. Okay? Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Now, the obedience of the children is based on the relationship between husband and wife as leaders of the, of, of the family and as persons that are in the Lord following the Lord. And so when the husband leads the wife well, loves the wife, the wife is uh, submission, uh, is present to her husband as is fitting in the Lord. They are both in the Lord. They are following God together. They are following God together as a family. God blesses them with children. The children are being raised in the Lord. The children are being raised in the admonition of the Lord, the nurture of the Lord, the nurture of a loving family, husband and wife who submit to the Lord. This pleases the Lord. Okay, now, can this model break down? It breaks down every day. There's lots of reasons that this will break down. The primary reason is that 
the husband, the wife, the child is not in the Lord. They're not being taught the things of the Lord. They're not being raised in the faith. They are not submitting to the Lord. They are not listening to Him. They are not receiving direction from the Lord. They are not fearing the Lord. They're not putting the Lord first in their lives. There's an absence of church attendance. There's an absence of worship. There's an absence of Bible reading and prayer. And so when that starts happening and we take the Lord out of it, the idea of this process, as Paul is writing the Colossians, in the Lord is crucial. Fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. So the father has a very important responsibility in terms of the way he treats the children, in terms of the way he leads the children, in terms of the way he is an example to the children. So he not only has a responsibility to his wife, he also has a responsibility to the children. And so the Lord places a very high mark on the uh, father, on men, uh, as it were, and uh, expects uh, them to lead their family well, both in their marital relationship and in their parental relationship. They are not to embitter their children or they will become discouraged. That's not, sometimes not an easy thing to do. Sometimes that's a hard thing to do. Okay, but we want to be loving to our children. We want to be kind. We want to be merciful. We want to be compassionate. We want to be patient. We also need to practice forgiveness, as we saw earlier in chapter 3. We want to have the peace of God reign in our home. We want the presence of God to be present in the home so that the child, children, are raised in a loving, nurturing family. When that does not happen, then that becomes a serious issue as that person develops and grows in the Lord. If they're growing in the Lord at all, as they are growing in their life. So we spend a lot of time praying for families. We pray for husbands. We pray for wives. We pray for leadership in the home. We pray for the peace of God. We pray for the presence of God. All of those factors are very, very important. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything and do it. Not only this verse 22, when their eye is on you and to win their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Now, to say the least, verse 22 is uh, an extraordinary verse for this day and time to comment on it in 2024. Obviously, we do not have a situation in this country where we have masters and slaves. That was very, very common in the first century in the Roman Empire, the idea of masters and slaves. In fact, Paul's letter to Philemon, which is the, his last letter in terms of the order written, was uh, concerning a runaway slave, Onesimus, uh, who was to go back to Philemon. And Paul, in that one chapter, just one chapter, several verses, is dealing with what is the right thing to do in terms of slave and master. This is an immensely complicated subject, and so our ability to handle this particular subject uh, is um, way beyond what we're trying to do or what I'm trying to do in this study. But he says, slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything. So obviously, we're not talking about torture and hurting people and maligning people and hating people and using them for, uh, in very, very nefarious ways. Uh, and do it not only with your eyes on you and when they're favored with the sincerity, heart, and reverence in the Lord. We're back to being in the Lord again. The masters need to be back in the Lord. So I'm just going to make some statements very similar to what I said earlier. In this relationship, which again no longer exists, people need to be in the Lord. They need to be before God. They need to treat each other as um, well, as people made in the image and likeness of God, in a loving way, in a compassionate way, in a caring way. And so the idea of and the subject of whether we should have slaves and masters at all is not a subject that Paul is taking up, much to the probably chagrin of a lot of people, but he's not dealing with that particular issue. He's dealing with the reality of slaves and masters and how that relationship can be bettered because they are in the Lord. Again, a very complex, complicated subject. Um, 
And I would say that uh, marriage and parenting, which we've kind of moved through fairly quickly, as I said I would do, is a very complica complicated and complex subject also. The relationship uh, and the concern and what is marriage is a very large subject in today's society. And the idea of uh, uh, the fact of parenting uh, the children from that relationship is a very, very complex, very large subject. Verse 23. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. Now, that is a fabulous sentence regarding work. So I'm sure there's many in this audience listening to me that has some kind of job or some kind of obligation in terms of what you do. You might get paid for it. It might be a volunteer situation. It does not necessarily have to be a paid situation, but a volunteer situation. And Paul is saying, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. So the first thing that we need to do is when we do something, work on it as hard as you can. Be faithful in the thing that you're being asked to do or that you're choosing to do, either by being paid or volunteer, as working for the Lord and not for men. So that we are ultimately working in the Lord. All right, remember back again what I said about husbands, wives, children, slaves. We are in the Lord. We are seeking the Lord. The Lord is in first place. What is God's will? How is God calling us to respond to these relationships? In the things that we do on a regular basis, we work at it with all of our heart. We're giving it everything we have. We're not stealing time. We're not taking time. We're not wasting time. We're not doing whatever we want to do. We are working at that particular project or what we're being asked to do or what we're being paid to do or what we want to do with all of our heart. We are working for the Lord. Now, that's a hard concept for me to get across because I'm getting a paycheck on a regular basis from someone, some entity in terms of providing services. And so I respond uh, and do the service, hopefully as well as I can. You are doing the service as well as you can, and then you're, there's compensation. Now, sometimes, again, when we volunteer, there's no compensation, monetary compensation. But if you're, sometimes when we are looking for compensation from human beings to say, oh, you did a great job, or you, you know, that can be problematic sometimes, could be because sometimes people don't respond uh, uh, that are paying you or asking you to do something. They should. They should be very grateful. They should. Uh, lots of kudos to pass out. But if I'm working for the Lord and not for men, if I'm thinking this is what God wants me to do, I'm doing this for the Lord. Now, that, that intellectually is a very big difference, and kind of emotionally, that's a big deal. We're working for the Lord, not for men, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It's the Lord you're serving. Again, this is a very profound concept in terms of daily activity. A lot of times, we don't kind of get the response that we'd like to get from people we serve, either by work, in terms of compensation, or volunteer, or just doing a nice deed, or helping someone out. But if we can see this from the perspective that we are doing this for the Lord, and that we will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a re reward, and it's God who we're serving, then, and this is the point that I'm trying to get to myself, and it's definitely not easy, then anything that we get in terms of compensation, or reward in this world from people, or you did a great job, or a letter, or a note, then that's just extra. That's just extra. Because ultimately, we are serving the Lord. Ultimately, we know that God is going to reward us in the next life with a wonderful inheritance because we are working for the Lord. We are working it with all of our heart. We are doing it with integrity. We are not working for men, although technically we may be doing that in a job. But on a higher level, we're doing it for the Lord whom we love and whom we serve. We are doing it as a result of God's will for us, and we are joyfully, lovingly, happily uh, with um, 
vitality and emotion, uh, enthusiasm. We are, we are doing God's will and God's word. Now, that's a lot to think about. A lot to think about in this particular number of verses that we looked at uh, for this class. Very large topics. The topic of marriage, the topic of parenting, the topic of work. Those are very, very large subjects, and we could say more about them. But this is a wonderful introduction to what some uh, verses that Paul is giving us from the Lord's perspective that he wants us to consider. Lord God, bless your people today as we continue to pour over the scriptures and study them. May God's mercy and grace and compassion be with us all as we continue to live in the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we look forward to seeing you next time as we'll continue our study. We'll review the end of chapter 3 of Colossians and begin on the final chapter, chapter 4. God bless you and enjoy your week of learning, prayer, and meditation.